Hello, welcome to at and Threat Track for August 20th, 2013. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. I'm joined today with Jim Clausing, Stan Erlov, and John Hugloom. I'm Brian Rixrod. And uh, I think what we'll talk about first today is, uh, well, there's been a lot of discussion that I've seen anyway about this new ZBAP map scanning tool. And uh, Stan, what can you tell us about it? Well, it's a new tool uh, released by the University of Michigan, and uh, most people are comparing it to Nmap and saying that it's a much faster scanning tool. In fact, in some of the tests that they did, they were able to scan a single port across the entire range of IPv4 addresses in about 45 minutes. So that's pretty significant. And they actually used this capability to try a few experiments. So for example, uh, because you know they're able to run this whole thing in an hour, they just tried running it throughout the day and seeing how the results differ hour to hour. Um, and one thing they found is that during uh, certain parts of the day, the response rate uh, can go up or, or can go down depending on time of day. They attributed it to um, possible congestion, so saying that some packets can't get through, and because of that, you have you know during busier periods, um, you get uh, you know, less machines responding back or, or being able to capture responses from fewer machines. I was thinking that perhaps, um, I don't know exactly how the experiment was conducted, perhaps it's because maybe also during certain times of the day there's fewer machines up. Um, so maybe, you know, less machines respond. Maybe it doesn't have to do with congestion. Um, other things they tried, which I thought was creative, is um, whereas Nmap sends maybe a single SYN probe, uh, what they did is they tried to experiment sending multiple probes at the same time. So to see if uh, the response rate increases. And they found that if you go from uh, like sending one probe at a time to sending three probes at a time, uh, your coverage goes from like 97.9% to 99.4%. So you get another like percent and a half uh, by doing that, uh, by, by sending more SYN probes. Um, other things they found is if they don't depend on the operating system to send out the packets, so they're using an optimization um, using the raw socket API. They found that if they don't uh, implement like a timeout, they actually get a better response rate as well. So machines will respond eventually over time, uh, but uh, you know, if you time it out like Nmap might do, uh, you, will, you will miss the responses and you won't record it properly. So they did a couple of these things. Uh, they did a couple of enhancements, all in an effort to, to be able to scan quickly. And uh, they were even able to uh, you know, start looking uh, for vulnerabilities on the internet. So there's this uh, UPnP vulnerability uh, that's been reported a while back earlier this year. And uh, they were able to write a, a probe to go ahead and scan the internet for that, and they found that 3.34 million devices out of almost 16 million devices that have UPnP are still vulnerable um, to this type of, uh, to the to UPnP vulnerability that was reported earlier. Uh, they were also able to identify 42 million unique SSL certificates out there on the internet, of which only 6.9 were trusted by browsers. So there's many, many more certificates out there than are, I guess, trusted by default by our browsers. And they even found two sets of misused um, certificates as well. Um, and other things they mentioned uh, in their paper uh, is that you know they can do things like discover hidden services uh, and used by Tor. Um, so a lot of quick discovery, I guess, relatively quick. And hmm. it affects, you know, anybody can use it. One thing I would say, you know, having reviewed the source code and the command line options of this tool, if you do try to use it, or if somebody tries to use it, you have to be very careful because there's no option to concentrate on a single range. So once you execute the command, it'll actually start scanning the entire internet uh, right there and there. Uh, so you have to be very careful with, with how you, um, you know, experiment with this tool because yeah, there's no I, way to just concentrate on one range. Yeah, good point, Stan. And I think it's actually probably pretty important to take a look at, I and mean, if you have any intentions of using this tool at all, Take a close look at their paper and the, uh, the or at least the uh, their presentation that they did. Um, it's available online. We'll provide you the link on the uh, on the Threat Track website here. But the, uh, the intent here is they provide some cautionary statements and use of the tool. Uh, I think in their scanning they had uh, a number of complaints that they'd received. Not a huge number, but they did receive some complaints about the scanning activity. 
and uh, had uh, basically proceeded to uh, black out or whitelist, uh, they called it blacklisting effectively, a number of addresses uh, as a part of their scanning activities. And so if you have any intention of using a tool like this, uh, it's important that you uh, take those uh, things into account. And I think what is at least as interesting from the, um, uh, from the presentation itself is they showed some graphics of uh, some of the things of their findings. One of them included uh, the level of outages that were identified as a part of uh, Hurricane Sandy around that time period. They did uh, scans on a daily basis to see where the outages were, and uh, that was kind of interesting. So they had some sort of, uh, you know, just uh, kind of gee whiz type uh, findings involved. Yeah, there are several applications like that that you can implement using this tool. It mm -hmm. just has to be used responsibly and carefully. They did mention that uh, whenever they got uh, a complaint from anybody, like you said, Brian, they just whitelisted them right away. And they do come with a, when you download the tool, it does have some uh, IP addresses already pre-whitelisted, so it won't, the tool won't scan them. Uh, but still, uh, the tool will scan the Internet when you try to use it. So you have to be very oh. careful with it um, if you ever decide to try to use something like that. Oh, well, it will scan the IPv4 Internet. Ah. Very right. good point, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one of the things that we've talked about a couple of times in the past was that, you know, with the huge increase in uh, address space with IPv6, that, that standard scanning techniques probably aren't going to work there, at least until you get bigger pipes than the one gig that these guys were talking about here. Um, even doing things in parallel, you're not going to be able to scan all of the IPv6 address space in any kind of reasonable time just because it's, you know, several orders of magnitude larger. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, unless some uh, crazy technique is developed. And uh, I'll leave it as homework for you, Jim, to figure out, given a one gig pipe and, say, 40 bytes per packet, how many pack, how long it would take you to, put, you know, pull the entire IPv6 address space. Have that answer for you the next time I'm on. <laughs> okay, I've never tried that calculation. I think it would actually be kind of an interesting thing to figure out. I, I'll bet it's uh, a big number, <laughs> a lot of time. Certainly, it's longer than 45 minutes. But I digress. Hey, you know, one a couple of other observations here. You know, this um, when I learned about this tool, it really reminded me of that Carna botnet and that Internet Census report that was done in 2012. Uh, in that case, they also had the capability to scan, and this was a, an unrelated group, but um, it's, uh, they also had the capability of scanning the Internet in a fairly uh, short period of time. I don't recall specifically the time that it took. I thought they said something around an hour and a half, but they used a, uh, actually a rather large botnet that had been created effectively um, uh, without permission of the end users and uh, to, to do that scanning. So in that sense, it, uh, this kind of represents an innovation. But on the other side of it, we're in just pre preparation for the show, had observed that we've seen some attacker groups using these kinds of techniques for some time. And so this is the first I'm aware of that uh, a group with uh, uh, good intentions has uh, shared some of the same capabilities. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, another topic here. And, uh, John, I think even the best of them occasionally have their little hiccups. And uh, so what can you tell us about some hiccups? Uh, yeah, thanks, Brian. So uh, a story that uh, came to our attention earlier this week is that Amazon uh, had a brief outage um, of about 15 minutes. Uh, some reports are a little bit longer, but in general we're going to stick with the 15-minute story there. And um, it's not so much, you know, the crux of the story to me is not so much that they were down or why they were down. Um, they did, um, you know, post a uh, notification on their website that, you know, they were down for some sort of maintenance and they would be back soon. Um, and that's really the message here, in my opinion, is that if you have any kind of downtime, especially unplanned, you should have some kind of, um, some kind of action plan set up so that you um, can kind of maintain your reputation. You don't want to present users with a 500 internal server error type page. You want to be able to present back a page that looks like it comes from your company um, and, you know, represents that you're aware that there's an issue, you're down for a period of time, and that might give people a chance to come back um, 
uh, and not be as concerned that it's some kind of hard crash that you're not even aware of. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amazon was really good about that. They did have kind of a, a playbook uh, in hand and were able to, you know, represent that they're aware of this problem. They pushed out a page that showed that um, they were aware of it, and uh, the downtime was pretty small. Given the, given, even given the fact that the downtime was small, some of the estimates, Forbes came back and said, you know, 15 minutes at around $66,000 a minute, I think they said, uh, is around a million dollars of potentially lost sales revenue. My take on that is, you know, just because Amazon was down for 15 minutes doesn't mean that I'm not going to come back in an hour and still put through that purchase that I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know that's going to dissuade me from not buying something altogether that I might have bought right at that exact moment. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think, John, just sorry for the interruption, but I think you it, you probably have a good point there in that I think by presenting, you know, saying something like, you know, we're we're down for a little bit, you know, being transparent about it, say, you know, come back a little bit later, we're sorry for the inconvenience, you're probably more likely to get revisits right. than to have to get frustrated and go off somewhere else. And the other thing um, about presenting some kind of page like that as well, and we've seen this before in certain types of DDoS attacks and whatnot, is if users aren't presented something from the website to let them know that something's happening, they'll tend to click and re-click and try to reload multiple times. Mm -hmm. And that might not seem significant, but if you have a large user population, you know, one click is one thing, but if they keep reclicking three or four times, that adds up when you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of users doing that right. all at the same time. Um, so giving them some kind of, some kind of uh, page lets you know what happened. So I think it's a good plan uh, for companies, especially larger ones, or even if you're small, because uh, it's not difficult to do this and set up some kind of um, default 500 uh, or even 404 page and whatnot. You can set mm-hmm. up all these error pages uh, on your website. So you should kind of have that, you know, already in, in your roadmap prepared in your battle plan such that if something unintentional occurs that you're not ready for, uh, you're at least not going to lose customers or, um, you know, have any damage to your reputation or at least less damage. Mm-hmm. Well, with the amount of uh, companies that depend on e-commerce for at least some of their income, um, you know, even even little mom and pop shops that have a web presence really need to put some effort into a, you know a business continuity and disaster recovery kind of plan for for these kinds of situations or for situations. And we were just talking about Sandy a, a little bit ago, and you know how much of the East Coast was without power for quite a while there. Mm-hmm. You know, so some sort of plan, um, preferably with some sort of a, a backup facility that is geographically, you know, not in the same place, you know, some cloud service or something, even to even to just put up this, oops, we've got a problem and we'll be back shortly kind of a page. You know, if it's if your server is in a building that just lost power and you're cut off, even trying to get that information out uh, takes some planning. Not only geographic diversity in your hardware uh, for your site, but geographic diversity in your support staff is pretty important. Mm -hmm. Because if all your support staff is in one part of the country, but you've got geographic diversity in your, um, your, your website or whatever, you know, your infrastructure, they might not be able to reach it just because they're all knocked out on the East Coast or something. So, um, you know, having some staff that's geographically dispersed is a good idea, too. Yeah. So you can see where this can be sort of have kind of a, uh, a sort of a waterfall effect in that, you know, you think about one level of uh, diversity or, or resilience, and then you can keep adding on pieces and parts. And I think that's kind of the night, neat thing about this article is that it, it kind of puts down, you know, quantifying what the potential damage is. And uh, I think that's an important part of this is try to get some idea how much money you really should be spending to prevent an outage of this type or, or any other type for that matter. And, uh, and then consider what really makes sense for the type of application that you're supporting. That is what tends to happen if you go off to some engineers and say we need you know, diversity and resiliency is 
they're not, you know, there are so many options and so many considerations to take into mind. Uh, it can become quite complex. And so it's a matter of balancing between what you actually put into place for resiliency or, or uh, of the service versus what the impact of some sort of an outage might be. And, you know, simply saying, you know, we, we apologize for the inconvenience. Perhaps it would be better to come back later. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, thanks for bringing this, John. I think this is, uh, a, again, a, an important lesson. We talk about uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability as being the triad of security. And I think it's worth emphasizing that uh, availability is an important part of this. And we've talked about in the past how, you know, sometimes confidentiality and integrity can uh, kind of be a balancing act or, um, you know, a, it's, it requires some balancing with availability. So uh, with that, you know, uh, we've talked about patching quickly, and uh, that's uh, good for security, but maybe sometimes it doesn't go exactly as you planned. Is it, am I introducing that correctly, Jim? Yeah, well, yeah, yes and no. Um, last week was Microsoft's uh, monthly Patch Tuesday, and they had uh, eight patches that covered 20-some-odd vulnerabilities. Um, one of them, one of the critical patches was an IE patch. The vulnerability had been demonstrated at uh, Camsec West in the Pwn to Own contest. So, um, yeah, that one was a critical one to, to patch. Then there were, I think there were three criticals. We don't have the list in front of me at the moment, and the rest were important. Um, the big news in the last couple of days is that um, some folks had some issues with a couple of them, and Microsoft withdrew um, at least one or two of them, um, especially the Exchange one. Apparently, a lot of people were having some issues with it, so they uh, they released another um, another patch. Uh, didn't get a separate bulletin. It was a different KB uh, knowledge base article um, to to apply to that one. Um, and the, there are, there's several reasons for bringing this up. Um, one, if you had issues with Exchange, um, make sure you go check Microsoft's uh, website for information on the additional patch. Um, but the, as I was thinking back, I, I think this is only the second or third time that I recall in the last five or six years that Microsoft has actually withdrawn a patch mm -hmm. and then had to reissue it. Um, so, you know, we, if, if this particular issue affects you, Obviously, it's a big deal, but um, in general, Microsoft for the last few years has done a really good job of of doing their you know, QA on it, testing it out before they release the patches um, to make sure they won't break other things. Um, so, so I would continue to recommend that home users um, continue to apply the patches as soon as automatic updates make them available. And corporate users, hopefully they've had for some time now a test environment where they test the patches out before they push them out to their user base and their servers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, the, the, there were three of them that I'm aware of that there were issues with in this month's cluster. One was the exchange one. The second one was a kernel patch that um, – the, the guy who reported it to Microsoft, um, if he had waited a couple more weeks uh, when Microsoft introduced their bug bounty program, he could have made $100,000 on this one. Microsoft has acknowledged this one was would have qualified for a, a big bounty. Mm. Um, but uh, some people have had issues with this one, and from the sounds of it, from other reports I've seen, and I, I don't have a link right now to a good article that details this, but um, it appears to be an interaction with other third-party um, kernel drivers and kernel modules being installed. So hmm. uh, Microsoft can't 
be expected to test all of their patches with every third-party right. application that's out there. And the, the third one uh, was with um, Active Directory Federation Services, and I'm not exactly sure what that all is, but they've already updated a release or a, released an update of that bulletin, and I believe they've re-released that patch already to fix the issues they found with that. So, um, you know, with anything as complex as a piece of software as Windows, uh, it's amazing that that Microsoft doesn't have more issues with their patches than they do. So, uh, while it affects some people, and I, I wanted to bring it up to make people aware, um, if you are having issues with some of this, you know, check out Microsoft's site. But as as complex a piece of software as it is, it's amazing that they don't have more problems. So I, I wouldn't really say you need to, to slow down applying the patches, continue to test them out in your corporate environment. And home users, I absolutely think, should continue to apply them as soon as they're available. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it's probably worthwhile to make a distinction here. It, it looked like most of these issues were associated with the servers. Is that correct? You, yes. Actually, yeah. um, the Exchange Server and Exchange Server and the Active Directory Federation services are, are, are definitely uh, server issues. The okay. kernel patch, I, I think it was affecting some home users as well. Mm -hmm. But and that one appears to be relatively um, infrequent and appears to be tied to interactions with some third-party software, and I'm not sure what that right. software is. Yeah, and, and I think um, that's a, probably a significant consideration. So you pointed out, you know, testing the software before you deploy it into, you know, significant environments. So it's certainly a server environment if you're going to deploy it, um, and it might have effect on a large user base. You want to try to get it tested as quickly as possible. And I would sort of emphasize that if you have what I would describe as a, um, you know, a special configuration where you're sharing the server with other functions, uh, third-party software, for example, um, something that they may not have tested with, you want to space, you know, put some additional attention into that kind of situation. Most of the cases, at least that I recall, have been that kind of circumstance where there's been some sort of interaction with a third-party software package that had uh, perhaps interfered. And, you know, any virus has had a, a, that sort of scenario occur in the past as well. And uh, so those are the kinds of things you probably want to pay the most attention to. Yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that, Jim. I think that's, um, you know, some uh, good, good points to keep in mind. Uh, let's take a little bit of a look at what's been going on on the Internet in the last week or so here. And uh, I would say, well, there's one here that I think is kind of a little bit new and different, but uh, probably not a secure, particularly a security issue. Uh, let's start with uh, port 1723 TCP. This is the point-to-point uh, -point tunneling protocol control channel. Um, that is, it's basically used to uh, control or set up GRE channels. And uh, we had reported some scanning activity near the end of July uh, that was somewhat persistent. I think there were a couple of episodes of that. You can see that in the graphic here. And, uh, but we're also more recently starting about, uh, I guess, about the second week in August, the latter part of the first week in August, seeing some fairly regular, it looks like, uh, daily scanning activity that's been taking place. Um, Kind of aggressive as well, so this uh, could possibly be a, a scanning a good portion of the internet. Has a very similar um, set of uh, patterns associated with it. Most of the probes are coming from uh, just a couple of addresses in China, and the um, the same sources are also seen scanning on occasion some other ports. Uh, and some examples of those ports include port 80, port 179, which is BGP and uh, port 8080, which uh, is a, um, you know, alternative uh, web port. So uh, we have seen uh, this activity going on. It seems to be continuing as well. Next item here is, uh, again, something we've reported uh, previously. This is port 5038. This is the asterisk voice over IP management port. And uh, most probes coming from a single address in China, we're seeing uh, a 
you know, continuing sort of spurious activity on this one. It's not nearly as regular as the previous. And uh, we have, uh, again, uh, talked about uh, the potential that they're trying to get access to voice over IP platforms for uh, perhaps um, uh, this is one of the methods for uh, conducting toll fraud. I suspect that might not be the case here. This may be looking for a backdoor into uh, enterprise networks, uh, my guess. Next one here, this is an increase or unusual number of bytes on source port 161 UDP. And uh, as we reported many times before, the continuing activity, uh, this appears to be SMP reflection denial of service attacks, distributed denial of service attacks, whereas um, you know, somebody is sending out packets with a spoof source address to SNMP servers that they've identified on the, on the internet, and those SNMP servers respond back to that spoof source address, which is actually the target of attack. And uh, for the most part, what we're seeing is um, you know, targeting consumer accounts, that is, uh, IP addresses that are associated with consumer uh, internet access, and uh, what I tend to refer to as sort of nuisance denial server attacks. They're generally short-lived, um, not particularly huge, but uh, enough to disrupt an end user and probably associated with uh, gaming activities that is trying to disrupt competitors and, and gaming activities. Um, it doesn't appear that there are a large number of groups doing this, but they certainly are doing it in a uh, reasonable amount of frequency. Next one here is uh, one that is relatively new and usual, unusual from my point of view. Um, this is uh, port 623 UDP, and I'm not exactly sure what this port gets used for, quite frankly. Uh, it's registered to ASF Remote Management and Control Protocol, and um, that ASF actually refers to, I, I believe it's Alert Standard Format, which is a uh, basically a alerting function. There are some alternative names for it. Uh, some folks refer to it as Alert Standard um, Specification or Alert, alert Specifications Form. Uh, but in any case, uh, this appears to be associated with uh, a telephony type function that may have been adapted to work on uh, uh, UDP protocol. And uh, what's uh, sort of interesting about this is just in the last day or so, we've seen some scanning activity pop up on this, uh, this particular port. It appears to be originating from a security company. I'm not sure what the uh, motivation behind that might be. And the next item here is uh, scan sources on port 1433 TCP. This is Microsoft SQL. And uh, this did get alerted on their Internet Protect service. Most of the sources are from uh, basically Asia. Uh, that would be China, India, Indonesia, and Taiwan being the most prominent countries that are showing up there. And uh, it was an increase from what we typically see is uh, maybe on the order of maybe 750 or so sources scanning on that, uh, on that particular port. Actually, around 500 might be more typical. And uh, peaking up around, uh, you know, just a little short of 2,000 sources uh, scanning on that port. So this is clearly botnet-related activity of some sort that is uh, something told all of those devices to start, start that scanning. And uh, just for... Um, you know, information purpose, as I mentioned, the countries that are the uh, predominant source of this activity, I thought it would show uh, sort of a density map. Now, this is the density here is uh, the number of addresses showing up in the same region. It doesn't have any uh, um, uh, influence from the number of probes that came from any particular place. But you can see here that there is uh, clearly a large concentration coming out of uh, India, China, Indonesia here. And then we'll take a look at the uh, top 10 most probe ports. And uh, as usual, we see port 445 near the top here. But it's uh, kind of interesting that port 53 UDP is showing up as uh, actually almost as, uh, as many probes as uh, port 445 TCP and then a close follower being 1433 TCP, which we talked about a bit earlier. Uh, port 3389, that's uh, remote desktop protocol, shows up next. Uh, port 22, port 23, uh, port 80, port 8080. We mentioned um, the port 80 and 8080 a little bit earlier. All are showing up on this graph. And uh, in terms of the most sources doing that probing, as usual, port 445 on the top. Uh, and then we're also seeing uh, much farther down, ranking about uh, sixth or seventh here, port 80, port 1433. Um, and then we see some peer-to-peer uh, -peer activity showing up as well. Um, 
one of these supports here, 27015 UDP is associated with uh, gaming activity. And then we still see some peer-to-peer -peer activity associated with uh, the zero access botnet. Um, but uh, I believe that in terms of overall activity has um, diminished significantly. And uh, that's our show for today. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, please uh, send us email. Uh, we've gotten some good email lately, and uh, we welcome that. You can send it to threattrack at lists.att.com. Uh, you can find us on Twitter as well at threattrack. Threattrack is uh, available in video form. It's available from the at t Tech Channel. It's att.com slash threattrack. It's also available on YouTube. Uh, you can subscribe to an audio only version on iTunes. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Stan, Jim, and John for joining, and uh, we'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, keep your network safe.